Good morning. Oh, the band. I thought I just thought the band sounded great today. I love that. Revelation song. Revelation song. Welcome this morning. If you're a guest, thanks for being here. I'm Pastor Dave. Hopefully uh, I know your name or I can get to know you. It's Labor Day weekend. Happy Labor Day weekend. And if you're watching online and you're camping, uh, we're sorry if it's raining. And uh, you enjoy that time in your little box down there. Now, we, we appreciate it. I've got a few people who texted me from the first service who were watching from a distance, and we appreciate If you can't be here, tune in, right, one of our services, and uh, listen online. You can always, during the week, go to our website and, or to our YouTube channel and, and find the, uh, at least the sermon well, we, uh, as you can tell, are in a series on the book of Revelation, and we don't have uh, a lot of time to chit-chat today because we've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to get right into it. Themes of Revelation. <clears throat> Maybe this is your first time here back in early summer, back after it started, uh, we did a series on the themes of Genesis, and a lot of the themes of Genesis tie in with the themes of Revelation. I don't know if you've noticed that. Maybe before I finish this series, I'll show you how that works. But we're kind of halfway through here, and I want to give you a couple summary points for what we've said so far, because I, I don't want you to miss the big picture. If you miss the big, if you get bogged down in the little details and in trying to find a timeline, trying to figure out this matches this and this country and this nation and then you're, you're going you're gonna to miss the big picture. Don't miss the big picture. This book was written for a purpose. And first of all, it was meant to encourage believers to remain faithful in times of persecution and times of trouble. Now, I want to tell you something. If your view of this book precludes or prevents first century believers from understanding what John was writing then I, I would challenge you to, to rethink that view because this book was written primarily to first century believers. And then because it's the word of God, it applies to believers of all ages, just like the rest of the word of God. So there are a lot of views of Revelation <clears throat> that say, oh, well, they, this, this is applying to this age of the church or that age of the church. And there's some people say, well, we're living in this particular age. Well, we are living in the church age, but this book would have been understood fully by the first century Christians. They were 60 years into a time of persecution, another 220 years to go. It was going to get worse before it got better. And then when it got better, it really got bad. And if you know your church history, when Constantine declared Christianity the state religion, now everybody wants into the church because it's a popular thing to do, and the spiritual depth just kind of bottomed out at about half an inch. And that's what happened to a lot of the, the church throughout the Middle Ages. But here they were suffering. They were holding the line, many of them. They were suffering for wearing the name of Christ. And they remember Jesus told his disciples in John 16, 33, in this world you're going to have what? tribulation. You're going to have trouble. And if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. Now, it's a hard number to pin down because uh, historians, you know, dis disagree on the number of Christians that were killed during these first 300 years of Christianity. But the numbers mostly range anywhere between two and six million. The Roman Empire by 300 was only 60 million people. So if, if it was 6 million, that's a, you know, that's a percentage point of the Roman Empire that, was, that had been killed over a period of 300 years or thereabouts. So that's a lot of people dying. But listen to this. According to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, between the years 2000 and 2010, that's your lifetime and my lifetime, every year... For 10 years, 100,000 Christians were killed in the world. Now, granted, 
a lot of those, most of those were in the uh, Civil War in the, in the, um, uh, the, the Congo, the, um, uh, what's it called, the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, but still they were Christians being killed for their faith. That's a million people in a 10-year span where when we're talking about the early church, we're talking about 2 to 6 million in a 300, not quite 300, 250-year span. So here's what I want you to know, that Christians today, today, are the most targeted and persecuted religious group in the world. Now, you and I live in America we don't experience it as much, but it's, it's starting, we're starting to experience persecution, aren't we? I mean, it's what you might call light persecution. We're being marginalized. We're being called, we're being called radicals or extremists. It's very unpopular today to go out there and say, I'm a Christian. In fact, not m many of uh, today's Christians would announce on their social media account, I'm a Christian and I believe in uh, life and not abortion. I believe in heterosexuality. And we could just go down a list of things. Because today's Christians would be afraid to say that. And half of them wouldn't even believe it. So to be a Bible-believing Christian, it takes some guts today. Because you're not going to be popular. What would it take for you to throw in the towel on your faith would it take a little bit of heat would it take some persecution of of the sort that people were making fun of you ridiculing you uh calling you an extremist calling you a fanatic or old-fashioned or you know you why do you hate people why do you hate these people remember the bible tells us to speak the truth in love and that's what we have to figure out how to do how do we disagree with someone who is clearly, willfully, deliberately living outside of the will of God, outside of what we believe the Bible teaches. They're doing it willfully, knowing what the Bible says, and they're still doing it. How do we speak the truth in love to them? How do we love them? Some people have family members who are in that situation, and it's one of the hardest things to do. I know, I know this. I know this from my own larger family. It's hard to disagree with someone in that way and do it in love. It's the test of our time. But one thing we cannot do is we cannot throw the towel in on our faith. It's no time to compromise. It's no time to have a lukewarm faith. What would it take for you? How about some trouble? Pastor and best-selling author John Ortberg tells about when he was in ministry at a particular place, he used to go to a convalescent home and visit a woman named Mabel she didn't have family, and uh, she got sick a little bit earlier in life, and for 25 years she laid in this hospital, this, this convalescent home bed. And he would go in, uh, you know, with the smell of sickness and stale urine, and he would visit her uh, almost every week. She's completely blind and nearly deaf, and he goes and he takes his Bible, and sometimes he takes a hymn book, and he'll read the Bible. When he starts reading Bible verses, oftentimes he said she would start quoting the Bible verse with him because she knew it so well. And when he would open up the hymn book, he would start singing a song, and she would start singing that song because she knew most of the hymns in the book. And so this woman was a happy woman, and she didn't she didn't talk about all that she had been through. She didn't talk about her troubles, her pain. She, she didn't talk about her loneliness and the fact of having no family. She just talked about her longing for heaven. She did this for 25 years. And Ortberg one day asked her, he said, Mabel, what do you think about while you're laying here every day? Every day, just staring at the ceiling. Of course, she couldn't see. What, what, do, you, what do you think about just laying here? And she said, oh, I think about Jesus. He said, well, what do you think about when you think about Jesus? She said, oh, I think about how he has been awfully good to me in my life. He's been so good. And then she began to sing, Jesus is all the world to me. How many old timers we have out there who remember that hymn? Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. 
And there's a woman who, you couldn't do anything to her to get her to throw in the towel on her faith. What would it take for you? Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. Expect it. Don't run to, the, uh, to your neighbor or the preacher or anybody and say, oh, I got trouble. Oh, okay, that's what Jesus said you're going to have. It's not what you're going to have. It's what you're going to do about it. Where are you going to turn? Where are you going to turn? He said, I have overcome the world. Take heart. So I want you to understand that this book was written to give you that encouragement and to give the first century and believers of every century. Secondly, believers can be encouraged. We can get encouragement because we, we, we see Jesus clearly. We, he's on full display here. Remember, we have the Jesus of the Gospels, and then that picture is completed when we have the Jesus we see in the book of Revelation. And if you're going to die for someone, if you're going to lose your property or lose your family or lose your life or limb, you want to know that you're doing it for a good cause, a worthy cause. You're doing it for someone who deserves it. And as we've sung this morning and sung over the past, every Sunday really, Jesus is worthy and deserving of everything you and I can give him, including, if necessary, the laying down of our lives. Now, that's a very un-American uh, uh, thing now. and It's becoming less and less popular to, to stand on a front line somewhere and die so that others might live. But, but that's the most noble of things that we can do for him. So last week we saw this great worship scene in Revelation 4 and 5, and, and the, the one on the throne, the father, the ancient of days, was holding the scroll, and no one could open it, so John began to weep, which to me symbolizes a world without hope and without a savior. But an elder tapped him on the shoulder and said, don't worry, there is one who's worthy to open it, and he's on his way. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and when John turned around to see this lion king, he didn't see a lion king. He saw a bloodied and wounded lamb standing as if it had been slain. He saw the most vulnerable of creatures. And the lamb walks up to the father and takes the scroll and begins to open the scroll. It's got seven seals, which means it opens a little ways. You can read it, and then you have to pop another seal. You know, it's a, it's a scroll. So you roll it and you pop another seal until the whole scroll is out, seven seals. And so what we're going to see here from chapter 6 to 18 at least is the wrath of God. It's the wrath of God. Now this is not a very popular theme. It's, it's not a very common theme. We, we like to talk, when we talk about God, we like to talk about the love of God, don't we? We like to talk about the grace of God. We like to talk about the mercy of God, but we don't really like and don't talk very much about the wrath of God, but the wrath of God is a real thing. If God is love, God has to be a God of wrath because if people willfully rebel against him, he has to deal with evil that's going to transpire in the world. So what we're going to see here is we're going to see the wrath of God on the unrighteous, and you and I... Contrary to what some people believe, I believe that you and I are going to be affected by what's going to happen on the earth. We are going to be affected. In fact, I just told you, for one whole decade, 100,000 Christians were killed, and they're Christians being killed today for their faith. You and I are going to be affected Everyone will be affected. There's going to be pain and suffering and loss, but don't fret it. Don't worry. You might go through pain, but in the end, ultimately, Jesus is going to protect you, give you ultimate safety. That's the message of Revelation. Now, if you've ever had trouble understanding the book of Revelation, I'm going to help you out today. I'm going to give you the easiest way to understand this book. You don't have to be concerned about timelines, you don't have to be concerned about ages of the church, you don't have to worry about the nations and what nation and where's America in the, in the Bible prophecy and what about Russia, what about China and look, what's going on today. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff because remember, Revelation is a book of symbolism. It's a book of symbolism because it's an apocalyptic book. But I'm going to show you how to understand this book. Definitely there, there are real things in Revelation, don't get me wrong, but it's, they're symbolized 
by these figures and numbers and, and uh, um, these images. They're, they're symbols of what's going on. And these first century Christians would have related a lot of what's going on to the situation they were in, which was the combating with the Roman Empire. Not combating physically, but you know, trying to live their faith and live in an empire that grew to hate them. So here's the key in my understanding, and I think it'll help you if you're not if you're not clear about Revelation, if you're not if you don't know how to interpret it. I think this is going to help you. It really helped me several years ago when I came to this understanding. And the key is is in a word, recapitulation. Say that word with me. Recapitulation. It's a nice word to add to your vocabulary. You can throw that around at dinner today if you want to. And and it's not new to you. Maybe yesterday uh, or over the, the weekend, and today, you, you watch a college football game. Anybody watch any college football games? You ever watch a game on TV? Or even some movies are built this way, where you get different views of the same event. So they might do a replay, and a play happens, and you watch it, and you say, oh, I need to see that again. Then they do a replay from a different camera angle, and you, oh, oh okay, he did catch the ball, or he didn't catch the ball. Or, you know, it was a helmet-to-helmet. Helmet. And so you see these different things, but it, you're, what you're seeing is the same event. You're seeing the same event, and that's called recapitulation, where you see it here, then you see it here, then you see it here. Sometimes you'll get a movie where you'll watch, and it'll be from this perspective, and then, you, and then it'll flash back and see it from the a main character's perspective. It's a little bit different. That's called recapitulation. It's not new to the Bible. You might remember the story of Joseph when Joseph went to, uh, you know, to Egypt, when he was sent down to Egypt, he eventually, because of God's power for him to interpret dreams, became known to the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh had a couple dreams. You remember the dreams the Pharaoh had? His first dream was of, of uh, 14 cows. Seven cows were, were nice and healthy, fat cows. I mean, good, good beef. And then seven unhealthy cows came up out of the water and ate up the healthy cows. And the Pharaoh was disturbed by this because the, the, health, the, the unhealthy cows didn't ever get healthy by eating the healthy cows. They stayed sick. And so none of his magicians... Uh, none of his uh, consultants, his advisors could explain this dream, so he had another dream. In this dream, it was seven healthy grains of wheat, uh, heads of grain, rather, seven healthy heads of grain, and then what happened next in the dream is seven unhealthy, blighted, sickly gr uh, heads of grain came up and ate the seven healthy heads of grain. And so <clears throat> he was greatly disturbed in the uh, the the uh, uh, not the baker maybe the uh, uh, candlestick maker or something he came uh, to the pharaoh and said I remember a guy in prison who interpreted dreams and so they called Joseph up and Joseph uh, not only pharaoh said I'm going to test you I'm not going to tell you the dreams if you're legit you got to tell me what dreams I had and then explain them to me that's pretty tough huh and so Joseph did just that and he said I want to tell you uh, what you're seeing here is is seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And if you don't prepare for the, for the seven years of famine by using the seven years of plenty, then uh, the nation of Egypt and all the surrounding areas is going to suffer. And remember, that's when Jacob, because they were suffering, that's when he, he came in. And because Joseph had prepared, Pharaoh put him in charge, Joseph uh, was able to feed his entire family. But listen to what Joseph said to the Pharaoh in Genesis 41. Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. In other words, you saw two different dreams, but they're of one thing. God is showing you what he's going to do. I believe the visions of John and the revelation are one. God is giving him multiple visions about what's coming, about one thing. And so we have, from three different perspectives, so we have seven seals, then we have seven trumpets, we have seven bowls. Now, there will be people with the view that, that this is a linear view of history. It's called the historical view, that the seven seals will happen 
and that's one age, and then the seven trumpets will happen, and that's an age, and then the seven bowls of wrath will happen, and that's another age. But I don't see it that way. I see it kind of like interwoven circles. So you can see this picture interwoven circles <clears throat> where they're all connected because if you'll notice when you read this, when we read through this, the seventh seal is the seven trumpets and the seventh trumpet is the seven bowls of wrath. So they're, they're interwoven. They're three different visions of one event and that one event is the second coming of Christ. And so that's what we have here. Now we can't read this entire chapter uh, without getting a little flair. So I'm going to have it read to you. So would you listen? We're just going to read this chapter in its entirety. We can't read all these chapters, but we'll read a little bit from them. But listen uh, and follow along as Jesus begins to open up the seals. Chapter 6. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people should slay one another and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? All right, so this is the, the seals Verse 6 of 7, remember the seventh seal, we're going to see the trumpets. And what we see here is we see uh, uh, economic chaos. We see false leaders, antichrist. We see war. We see famine. We see inflation. We see death. And while some people would say, well, this is all in the future, I would beg to differ with you based on what I told you about what's going on in the world right now today. People are seeing these things happen. Now, I want you to notice a phrase here. This phrase is um, in, uh, in verse 6 here. You can look in your own Bible. It says, do not harm the oil and the wine. And here's what this means. What this means is that the wealthy are not going to experience the repercussions of these seals or these events like the rest of the world. Now, this could explain why you and I as Americans 
a lot of people have this view that, oh, this can't be, it, it can't, we can't be living in this time. This can't be the tribulation he's talking about because we live in the richest country in the world. Median income people here in America are richer than most of the world, 90, 95% of the world, people living in the world, and of all time. I'm talking about kings and royalty of ancient times, middle, e middle age times. You and I are richer than they are. I mean, you think about what we have today with electricity and running water and medicine and all the things we have today that they didn't have even in the, even in the king's palace. So I tell you this because don't let your American, wealthy American, I know you don't think you're wealthy, but compare yourself to people living in Haiti, for instance, or in Africa or Asia. Your, don't let the American viewpoint skew your view of this book. This stuff is going on right now. And when, when we look at this, we, have to, we, we can't be lulled to sleep saying, oh, no, it must be sometime in the future. I believe the Lord could return today, and he wouldn't owe us any explanation about anything else that needs to happen in our view in the Bible. We couldn't say, but Lord, wait a minute, this has got to happen, Russia's got to do this, and China's got to do that, and the U.S., no, no, no. He could return today, and all this stuff would have already been fulfilled. You with me? So this is pretty, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a pretty uh, dramatic scene here, and uh, it, it is a second, it's a picture of the second coming. I mean, stars are hitting the earth, the, the, the sun is, is blackened out, the, uh, the sky is rolling up, and uh, it, this is a second coming event. It's cataclysmic. You know, I watched the movie Armageddon not too long ago, and the president, you know, that asteroid that was coming at the earth, and Bruce Willis had to go and drill a hole in it and explode it. Y'all see that? Anyway, the president asked him, how bad is this going to be? How bad is the death toll going to be? He's, and uh, Billy Bob Thornton's character said, total. It's total. It's an earth-ending event. And that's what we got described right here. This is a second coming. The seven, the seven seals, the first six of the seven seals, this is a picture of the coming, and the last question is the important question, who can stand? No one. No one can stand. The only ones that can stand are those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Chapter 7 is like a commercial break. It's a commercial break designed to remind us that if you're with Jesus, if you're one that has this, his seal in your, on your forehead, now I don't think that's a literal seal. Christians are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and it's how you think. It's what you do with your hands. You know, talk, we're going to talk about a mark next week, but it's, it, these are symbols for how you think and how you act. And so in chapter 7, this commercial break, he's saying, take a breath. You know, you've seen some pretty bad things, but don't worry about that because if you're with me, you're going to be fine. He says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel descending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, don't harm the earth or sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. John heard this number. He didn't see this group. He heard this number. What he saw when he turned, like seeing, hearing about the lamb and turning to, uh, hearing about the lion and turning to see the lamb, he heard about 144,000, but he turned and saw a multitude from every tongue and tribe and nation. I say that because some people believe the 144,000 represent the Jewish people. There are problems with the list, though, that you see in chapter 7. It's not a normal list, which leads us to believe he's not really talking here about the Jewish people because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek nor Gentile. Uh, we're all one. So these questions, who, who, do, who do the angels represent? 
They're holding back God's wrath. The fifth angel is probably an archangel. The 144,000 represent a complete number of the Old Testament 12, the New Testament 12 times 1,000, this, this set time, 144,000 redeemed people on the earth. That's who the multitude is. So this, that's this chapter. And this chapter leads us to the next set of of uh, this next picture of God's wrath, and that's the trumpets. Let's look at the trumpets real quick. Trumpets were used in biblical days to sound an alarm or to sound the battle cry of war. And that's the way I want you to see this, is that we are to blow a trumpet. Philip mentioned in his communion meditation that our purpose is to share the good news. But listen, folks, it's more than that. It's more than that. Our purpose also is to warn people. It's to clearly explain to people the coming wrath of God on the unrighteous. And we need to do that in love. And that's the challenge for us. I don't know if you remember, some of you, what happened the day after Christmas, 2004. In 2004, the day after Christmas, December 26, a, an earthquake happened in the Indian Ocean. And this earthquake caused a tsunami that wiped out a lot of the beaches of Thailand and killed 230,000 people. I don't know if you remember that. You can go back and, and research that. There was this little 10-year-old girl named Tilly Smith. Tilly Smith was there, and she had just had in class a couple weeks earlier in a geography class the signs of a tsunami and how to recognize them. And so as soon as she saw these this bubbling water and then the Water rushed back in, I mean, like it was being power sucked back in toward the ocean. She recognized immediately that what was happening was a tsunami. Many of the adults went down because they had never seen this kind of thing before, and they were down at the, at the, uh, at the low tide where the water had been sucked away, kind of wondering what in the world was happening, but not Tilly Smith. Tilly Smith was warning people. First, she warned her parents. She said, we got to get out of here. we got to get off the beach. That's a tsunami. A tsunami is coming. And because of Tilly Smith's warning, over 100 people were saved that day. Over 100 people were saved. And it was a, a complete devastation uh, for so many people. 230,000 people were killed because of Tilly Smith. Over 100 were saved. And as a Christian, I want you to kind of see this understanding of Revelation in that way. Is that you and I have a responsibility to warn people what's coming. To warn them to get ready, to get off of the beach of evil, to get, get right with God, to get into safety and the presence and the comfort of God. That's what we need to be doing. And that's what John is trying to say is, look, trouble's coming, folks. It's, you know, it, like the tide, you know, the seven seals kind of come up and they're, they're bad, but we've all seen them before. Let's be honest. We've seen death and we've seen inflation and economic chaos and we, we've seen uh, leaders rise up and claim to be superheroes or claim to be Messiah type. We've seen all of what happened in the seals. You and I have seen this in our lifetime. The trumpet's Come a little bit closer, though. They're a little bit more like the plagues of Egypt were. And it's going to be total devastation. Despite all of the view that we get, chapter 9, verse 20 says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or the thefts. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He said, the primary thing that keeps people from turning to God is not unbelief, it's rebellion. You can either, in times of trouble, run away from God or run to God. And so we get these images of the wrath of God in these trumpets, and it's almost like Jesus is saying, I know this is a lot to process. I know, I know this devastation that you're seeing unravel right before you is, is hard to understand, but sit down, take a deep breath, and I'm going to give you another break. And so chapter 10 is another commercial break, really, chapters 10 and 11. And we have a little scroll that John's supposed to eat. Every commercial should have food, right? And so we've got a little scroll here that John's supposed to eat. Ezekiel was told to eat a scroll. A scroll is the word of God. 
And here's what that symbolizes. You and I, in all Christians of all ages, we should chew on the Word of God. We should digest the Word of God. We should, we should let it permeate every muscle of our being because hard times are coming and we're going to need something. We're going to need some strength, some spiritual strength. If all the Bible you get is what you get when you come to church on Sunday, then you're going to be a very weak Christian. And the first trouble that comes your way, the first time some hard times come, you're going to be like, oh, what's happening to me? But if you have God's Word in your heart, you're hiding it in your heart, and you're letting it permeate, permeate every cell of your body, then when hard times come, you're going to have an answer. You're going to know how to act. You're going to know what to do. You see, God wants to do something in you before... He's going to do something through you. And that's what this little scroll, eating this little scroll John was told to eat. Then there's a measuring rod, which, which I think symbolizes God saying, look, I have measured out the safety place. If you want to be safe, get here. Get inside here. And that, and that is the church. Get inside. Now, I'm not talking about a building. Obviously, the church is all over the world. Um, but, but this measuring rod is Jesus saying, look, there's clearly marked boundaries of where you should be and where you shouldn't be. And if you think you can live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church, then you're mistaken. Get in. Get all the way in. Get involved. Start serving. Get involved with people around a table and start discussing and Start doing things together so that you can impact your family and their world. What we have today is a lukewarm church in America that thinks we can, we can kind of keep a foot out there and a foot in here and we can show up when we want to, when it's convenient to us. We can, we can kind of do church, you know, as, as it's convenient for us, but it's not really who we are. And so I think this is the warning here. This is the measuring. This is, it's clearly marked. And we don't have to compromise. You know, we can, we can believe the Bible. We don't have to worry about putting stuff on social media that we know is true. What we believe from the Bible about abortion, about homosexuality, about transgenderism, about any other hot topic issues. Because the Bible says it. Our goal is to speak the truth in love. And that's the, that's the challenge for us. But don't be afraid to get inside the clearly marked boundary of the measuring rod. And then we have two witnesses, which some to believe Moses, some believe to be Moses and Elijah because of the power they're showing in the text there in chapter 11. But, you know, I like to think it's, uh, it's you and me. You and, you and I are the two witnesses, and you and you, and you and you, and you and you, and you and you. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. And though they may put you down, they may kill you for your faith. Don't worry. Just like the two witnesses, you'll come back to life. And so at the end of chapter 11, my last scripture for today, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who was, and who is, and who was. <laughs> For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged came, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and earthquake, and heavy hail. This is another picture of the second coming. It says, your, the time of your wrath is here. And so we have this in the seven seals, we have a picture. Right here at the end of the seventh trumpet, we have a picture of the second coming. That's what we're seeing picture after picture with commercial breaks in the middle to, so we can take a breath and kind of be reminded that God's going to take care of his people. Now, believe it or not, I, I was going to try to get all the way to chapter 18 today, but when I started looking at the, my word count, I said, no way, I'm going to have to add a sermon. So I... Next week will be a continuation of this sermon, 
And guess how many sermons that'll make for the series? And this occurred to me after I did it. Seven. <laughs> It'll make seven sermons. I should have planned it in the first place because it's the series on Revelation. But the message is cl so clear. It's not a time to be lukewarm. It's not a time to compromise. It's time to get ready and help others get ready for the return of Christ. You might say, when's it going to happen? It's been so many years. It's going to happen. It's going to be like a thief in the night. You're not going to be able to uh, you're not going to be able to grab anything. You're not going to be able to take any pictures or post anything. It's going to happen that fast, and it could happen today. When it happens, some people are going to be like, oh, man, I was almost ready. And some people are going to say, I'm glad I stayed ready, and I hope that's you. Lord God, thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Thank you for this uh, book and these seven seals, these seven trumpets. We'll look next week at the seven bowls of wrath that you gave, and I pray, God, that in all of them we would see a a powerful picture of the return of your son to come and deal with evil once and for all, to redeem the righteous once and for all and take us out of this world. Lord, that's my prayer, that all within my hearing, whether here or online, would be persuaded to get both feet in, to get, to get all in to your church and to be there, to be counted on, and be ready and help others get ready for your return. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and let's close with one more worship song.